that if I didn't come back to the denomination, they said, uh, you're going to be going to where the sun doesn't shine. Yeah, they didn't have to specify that, Sandy. I got a clear message when they said that. I really did. They told me I was going, that I was an apostate because I wasn't in the ship. That's what they told me in no uncertain terms. Well, that was after I had talked that morning on what the ship was that was going through, but unfortunately, they weren't there. They weren't there. Let's take a look at it. The statement from letter 55, uh, 1886, it's also in 7th Bible Commentary, page 911. It says, the church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. So they told me, they said, you're one of those sinners in Zion that's been sifted out. So you've got to come back because right now you're a lost sinner because you're not in the denomination. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. Now notice, as Ellen White describes the church, she begins to specify what makes up the church. She says, none but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. The remnant, now she's going to describe the remnant. Listen to what she says. The remnant that purify their souls by obeying the truth gather strength from the trying process exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. It's very interesting in this statement, Ellen White is not talking about buildings and organizations and denominations. That's not what she's talking about. She's talking about people that have an experience with God. That's what she's talking about here, folks. Again, those who are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, that's the church. The remnant church are those who are purifying their souls by obeying the truth. That's the church. That's the church. Acts of the Apostles, page 11. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten Son. From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. There's God's church. It's those that are faithful to Christ, those who are submitted to Christ, and those who are allowing Christ to live out His life in their life. Amen. And sharing God's truth with others. Therein is God's church. In every age, the Lord has had His watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they lived. You know, this is a huge, huge issue. It was over in Germany. In fact, I was told, and I don't know how to be anything else but totally blunt. You know, I was told over there, they said, you know, Bill, if, if you tell the German Adventists that they need to stay right in the church and they need to squirt glue on the pew and, you know, squirt it on the pew and just sit down and stay there no matter what goes on in the church. They said, the Adventists in Germany would love you. Oh yeah, they said they would love you. They said you could go into an auditorium with, where they'd seat 500 to 1,000 people and every seat would be full. 
because denominational Adventists want to hear that. And they said that's why Walter Weith is so famous over here in Germany because he tells the German people, get your glue, squirt it in the pew, and sit down. Doesn't matter if the German churches are part of the ACK. Doesn't matter if you don't hear the second and third angels messages in the church anymore. Doesn't matter. Just squirt your glue in the pew and sit down and keep your mouth shut. But the spirit of prophecy says something far different as to what the church is. It's those who are faithful, those who are in submission to Jesus Christ. That constitutes his church. The ship is going through to the end. Just stay in the church. You'll be fine, we're told. Well, that sounds good, does history bear out this feeling of carnal security is really biblical? What is it that really goes through to the end? What will survive the throes of these last days? As Babylon the Great flexes her muscles for one final assault on God's last day people. Babylon and Rome will give us the answer to this question. You know, we're going to go back this morning. In the times of Daniel and his three friends, the days of Zedekiah and Jeremiah, the prophet of the Lord, they lived in a time when Solomon's temple was still standing. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. But did the structure or that building, did that save any of God's people in a time of crisis? Is Solomon's temple, does it still stand today? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Solomon's temple did not even go through, folks. It was destroyed. See, in the days of Jeremiah, this is what the people were told. See if you see a parallel to us today. This is in Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah said to the Seventh-day Adventists of his day, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Isn't that what we are told today? It doesn't matter what we do during the week. Just make sure you come to the Adventist confessional every Sabbath morning. Confess your sins. Do exactly what the pastor tells you to do. Accept whatever he says is gospel. And then once that's over, you can go out and just do whatever you want just like you did last week. But it's all okay because you came into the temple on Sabbath. Is that how it is? That's how it was in Jeremiah's day. And that's exactly what Seventh-day Adventists are being told today. It's the same thing. We're saved by denominational membership. We're saved by an organization. Folk, we've never been saved by an organization. 
They weren't saved back then by an organization and were not saved today by an organizational church. Because of their association with Solomon's temple, the people felt secure. Just go into the temple on Sabbath. God's blessing rested there. The fire of heaven fell in the temple. We're safe if we worship there. That's what the Adventists were told. Just stay in the church. It'll protect you. They could excuse any wrongdoing and sin because they came into the temple every Sabbath. The temple was their security blanket. Did it save God's people when Babylon the Great arrived? Did Solomon's temple survive? Oh friend, it didn't survive. Didn't survive. The people were told just stay in the pot. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both ran into this Adventist mentality. Hasn't changed, folk. We still believe that somehow a church can save us just by going into it every Sabbath. And that's what we're told. That's what I was told in Germany. The people were led to believe themselves totally secure from any outside trouble as long as they stayed in the denominational structure church. That would protect them. In fact, Ezekiel, in the times of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the false teachers in, in Seventh-day Adventism were saying, the city is the cauldron, it's the boiling pot, and we're the flesh, just stay in the pot and you'll be okay. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, Ezekiel spoke to the Adventists of his day. He said, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah the son of Azur, Pelatea the son of Beniah, princes of the people. Now, do you remember when these 25 men were mentioned before in Ezekiel? Do you remember what they were doing? What were they doing? They were pointed toward the east. And what were they worshiping toward the east? The sun. They were sun worshipers. They were Seventh-day Adventist Sunday keepers. That's what they were. They professed to be an Adventist, but they were really Sunday keepers. You find that right at the end of Ezekiel chapter 8, those five and twenty men worshiping the sun towards the east. Now notice what these sun-worshiping Adventists were telling the Adventists of their day. Listen to what they said. Then said he, the Lord said to Ezekiel, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief. Mischief. And give wicked counsel in this city. Devise mischief? Give wicked counsel? What was their counsel to the Adventists? Which say, it's not near. Let us build houses this city is the cauldron. This city is the pot. And we be the flesh. Right there, folk. Jerusalem is the cauldron. You're safe inside the denominational structure. It will protect you. Babylon will never be allowed to hurt any one of God's children as long as they're in the pot. And what did Ezekiel say that was? What did the Lord say that was? The Lord said those men, those Adventist leaders, are devising mischief. Those Adventist leaders are giving wicked counsel in this city. If they're giving wicked counsel, in the Adventist denomination, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel's day, 
and they're in the denominational church, while they're in the denominational church, who were they following if they were giving wicked counsel? They were following the devil himself, fans. The devil him. Oh, but, but we can't speak against the Lord's anointed like that, can we? We can't say anything against a leader, can we? Do you remember what Jesus said about the Adventist leaders of his day? He said, you are of your father, the who? The devil. The devil. And the works of the devil you are doing. What did John the Baptist call the Adventist leaders of his day? What did he call them? Oh, generation of vipers. He called them snakes. Folk, when David did not touch the Lord's anointed, David had the chance to kill King Saul. Had a chance to lop off his head. David said, I will not kill him. But folk, to speak out and rebuke the sins in high places among the professed people of God, that is doing the work of a watchman on the walls of Zion. That's what God has called each of us to do, is to demand that truth be heard in God's church. So there were Adventist leaders that were giving wicked counsel among Seventh-day Adventists in the conference churches which were telling the people, don't worry, you're safe as long as you stay in the denomination. You'll be protected. Babylon the Great will never touch you. You wear the flesh. And what did the Lord say to Ezekiel, a faithful Adventist? He said, prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. You have multiplied your slain in the city. You have filled the streets thereof with the slain. So the sacrificing the death of God's people it was all charged on these apostate leaders who were leading them through wicked counsel to remain in apostasy as if that would protect them in a time of crisis. Didn't protect any of them, folks. Didn't protect them. Ancient Adventists were being taught the same principle that was taught at the Tower of Babel by Nimrod himself. They were being told that they would be safe and protected simply because they had gotten into the tower, into a structure that salvation somehow came by church affiliation and being part of a denomination. Folk, the idea that we are saved in a building or if we're saved outside of a building. You know, in, amongst us today, we have two extremes. We have one extreme that says salvation is in the organized church. And then we have the other extreme that says the church is Babylon. You have to separate from it and you have to be outside of it or you will perish. Both of those are extremes. When, when and where did salvation ever come where it was in a building or a denomination? It originated at the Tower of Babel. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, the Bible writers, Elihu, the last of the 
men to speak to Job in Job chapter 36 verse 3? Elihu said, I will fetch my knowledge from afar and ascribe righteousness to my maker. Elihu said, there is righteousness, but it's in my maker, Christ Jesus. He wasn't looking in a building, folks. Wasn't looking in a building. The psalmist David declared in Psalm 71, Psalm 71 verse 16, David said, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Folk, righteousness isn't in a building. It's not in a denomination. It's in a man. And praise God this morning, we can turn to the man Christ Jesus. You know, Jeremiah to counteract the men of his day that were giving wicked counsel in the Adventist church to stay in the denomination because in spite of its apostasy, it was going to go through. Jeremiah said, you're not going to find hope and strength in an organized church. He said, this is where you'll find it. Jeremiah 23, verse 6, the Bible says, in his days... Adventism shall be saved, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So salvation, salvation, power, righteousness, not found in an organization, folk, but it's found in Jesus Christ. And we can, we can throw our helpless souls, we can throw our helpless souls on Jesus Christ today. And He, because He dwelt in our sinful flesh, as the Bible says, He took not upon Him the nature of angels. He didn't come in the nature of angels. He didn't come with a nature like Adam before He fell. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, For he took, upon him, he took not upon him the nature of angels, but he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. So Jesus Christ took upon himself our nature, never once sinned in our flesh. Why? So that he could help you and me, so that he could provide us with strength that you and I do not possess. Even righteousness that Jeremiah says, this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So there, friends, we can turn for salvation this morning, not in a church, not in a denomination, but in a man. In a man. Desire of Ages, page 106, says to a people in whose hearts is His law, in whose, in whose hearts His law is written, the favor of God is assured. So it's not about what building we're in. No, it didn't say that, did it? It says to a people in whose hearts His law is written, the favor of God is assured. So if we are in submission to the principles of God's law, are we in God's favor? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. 
They are one with Him, but the Jews, the Adventists, had separated themselves from God. Because of their sins, they were suffering under His judgments. This was the cause of their bondage to a heathen nation. Their minds were darkened by transgression because in times past, the Lord had shown them so great favor, they excused their sins. They flattered themselves that they were better than other men and entitled to His blessings. Folk, the only ones of us that are entitled to God's blessings are those who are in submission to Jesus Christ and in submission to the principles of His law. Then, because of God's unmerited favor, we are accepted and we have His favor because we're in submission to Him. Jerusalem, the Adventist church, the Adventist denomination in 605 B.C., folk, Nebuchadnezzar came in in 605 and took captives, we read about in Daniel chapter 1. They went back to Babylon. Nine years, or eight years later in 597, Nebuchadnezzar came again. This time he took all the vessels out of Solomon's temple. And 11 years later, Babylon the Great, Babylon the Great came back to God's church again. And this time Solomon's temple was burned to the ground. The Adventist denomination, the structural church in the days of Jeremiah was obliterated because of the sins of the professed people of God. Micah chapter 3 and verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore shall Adventism for your sake be plowed as a field, and the Adventist church shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. You say, Bill, I don't know what translation you're reading from, but my Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> Well, folk, the Old Testament is it's a current event. The people that lived in the Old Testament, folk, they went to church on the seventh day of the week. They were seventh day somethings. And whose coming were they looking forward to? Christ's coming. That makes them an Adventist. So the people in Jeremiah's day they were Seventh-day Adventists. And the ancient Adventist denomination in Jerusalem that was centered in Solomon's temple was demolished. And as Micah said, it was plowed as a field. So when we read the word Zion and Jerusalem and Judah and Israel in the Old Testament, we are reading the ancient Adventist church. And those stand, folks, Solomon's temple stands as a warning today to us as Seventh-day Adventists. Are we trusting in a denominational church? Are we trusting in a building? Are we being told by wicked counselors, just stay in the church, squirt the glue on the pew, because that's where you'll find salvation. Are you listening to that kind of wicked counsel today? Folk, those wicked men that gave that wicked counsel, they were sun worshipers. And when Solomon's temple was destroyed, they were destroyed with it. We can read into this story, friends, the results of sun worship among God's people today. You said, oh, that, that's not happening. Folk, right now there is a guy in Alabama, a, an Adventist pastor, in your face, has a sign in front of his church that says, come and join us for Sunday worship. 
And folk, all that is is, that is a test to see how many Seventh-day Adventists will stand up and say, that's apostasy. That is garbage. Get that guy out of this denomination because we don't buy what he's doing. But you know what? No Seventh-day Adventists are saying anything. And so it's a test, folk, to see how many Adventists today will protest. And if no Adventists protest, then they'll start popping up all over the place. All over the place! Until the wrath of the Lord will be kindled, there will be no remedy, and the denomination as we know it today will be as Solomon's temple. That's where we're heading, folks. That's where we're heading. Very, very quickly. One of the great wonders of the ancient world has disappeared from the earth. Solomon's temple is no more. Obviously, the ship that goes through, it's not buildings. It's not organized worship in buildings. The only thing that survived when Nebuchadnezzar came through were faithful souls. Daniel survived. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived. And folk, those faithful men carried the torch of God's truth and it lit up, it lit up the world of that time. God did it through faithful souls. Men like Daniel, Ezekiel, and their friends left a great testimony to the power of God. They clung to God's truth and the world still is blessed by their witness. You know, in the fantastic book by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson called Truth Triumphant, Dr. Wilkinson shows that because of the prophecies that God gave to the prophet Daniel, within a hundred years, there were about six or seven different heathen religions that rose up in that area of the world by the devil himself to try to counteract the testimony of Daniel the prophet. Zoroastrianism in Persia, sun worship, Buddhism, Hinduism, and a host of other isms rose up because of Daniel's faithful testimony. Folk, that's what God, that's all God needs today. He just needs, He needs one. He needs one faithful soul today. That's all He needs. And He will turn this world upside down. One other history lesson for us before we close this morning. Come down to the first century AD. Jesus Christ walked this earth, reached out, extended the plan of salvation, invited people to accept Him by faith as the Son of God, to empower them to follow God's law. He did that, preached, for three and a half years. At the end of that time, he came to Jerusalem. He came to the Mount of Olives. He looked down upon the Temple of Herod in Silver Springs, Maryland, right there. Right there. And Jesus wept over Seventh-day Adventism. Why? Because Christ tried to save the people. They were clinging, they were clinging to their church to save them. Because the wicked leaders in Adventism in the first century said, just stay in the church, we'll save you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about your sins. Don't worry about what you do through the week. Just bring your money on Sabbath, confess your sins to the pastor, and do whatever the pastor says, and you'll make it through. 
And so every effort that the Son of God made to save ancient Adventists to a great extent failed because of the wicked counsel of the Adventist leaders of the first century. So that as Christ and the mob, the disciples, looked upon the city from the Mount of Olives, they turned because they felt so much pride in Herod's temple. And they turned to see the same pride in the face of the Son of God. And they saw Jesus in tears. His body was literally shaking. Because no matter what he tried to do to save an Adventist mindset that said salvation is in the church, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And so they looked upon this great scene, this, this massive structure of snow of Herod's temple. It was the wonder, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Herod's temple, it stunned the world for decades. Its opulence, its magnificence awed the old world for a long time. Many felt it would stand forever. It's going to stand forever. The Bible says in Luke 19, 41 to 44, when Jesus came near, he beheld the city he beheld Seventh-day Adventism and he wept over it. He said, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee around, keep thee in on every side, lay thee even with the ground, thy children within thee, they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Christ foretold from the Mount of Olives the destruction of the Adventist church in the first century. He foretold the destruction of the denominational structure in the first century. And do you know what the wicked Adventist leaders were telling the people? Stay in the church. As the Romans surrounded the city in 70 AD, as Titus and his men besieged the Adventist structure, organization, there in Jerusalem, in 70 AD, Great Controversy, page 29, tells us what the wicked Adventist leaders were telling the people that were in the city. Listen to what they told them. The worshipers were stricken down before the altar. The sanctuary was polluted with the bodies of the slain. Yet in their blind and blasphemous presumption, the instigators of this hellish work publicly declared that they had no fear that Jerusalem would be destroyed for it was God's own city to establish their power more firmly. They bribed false prophets to proclaim even while Roman legions were besieging the temple that the people were to wait for deliverance from God. Who told the people they were safe in the city? False prophets were bribed. Look at we'll give you, we'll pay you, we'll pay you 50,000 a year, we'll provide you with a parsonage, we'll pay your medical insurance, We'll, we'll give you 80% uh, off for your kids going to Adventist schools. But look, at, in order for you to get all of those benefits, 
You've got to tell the people that their only safety is in the denominational church. And if you tell them that, then we'll give you a plush job, your, you know, good medical, uh, discounts on education. We'll give you all those benefits. But you've got to tell the people, stay in the church. You know, it's interesting to me, and I say this in respect. I say this in respect for Dr. Walter Weith because his series on total onslaught that looked at um, various things like uh, two beasts become friends, the Islamic connection, revolutions, tyrants, and wars, uh, the health uh, talks he gave, the, the ones on science that he gave, uh, total onslaught is excellent. It's an excellent series. We send out those by the thousands because they're great. But it's interesting to me that after he came out with the series called Total Transformation, in which he told Seventh-day Adventists to take your Elmer's glue and squirt it in the pew and sit down and don't say a word, right after he gave that series, he started having a satellite television program that's on uh, satellite. I don't know. I don't have the channel myself. But I find it very interesting that those two things seem to happen simultaneously. Folk, it's false teachers. False teachers encourage people to stay in an apostate church and that that's where they will find salvation. That comes from a false teacher. Israel had spurned the divine protection. Now she had no defense. Well my, ancient Adventists had been taught you can be saved in your sins. Keep on sinning till Jesus comes. And you'll be saved. Don't listen to that old prophet. She was good for the 19th century, but she didn't write for today. You can't keep the law of God anyway. So why try? Let's just become a part with all the other ecumenical churches. And of course, let's not say anything against the Catholics because they're a Christian church just like we are. With those ideas that ancient Adventists were being fed, is there any wonder that Israel had spurned the divine protection and now she had no defense? What is God's people's defense today, folk? What is our defense today? Where is our defense? It's in submission to Christ Jesus in obedience to His law and the sharing of the first, second, and third angel's messages with the world. Therein is our protection. Amen. If we spurn that, if we shun that, if we laugh at the spirit of prophecy and we, we laugh with those who make fun of Ellen White, we expect God's blessing? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Oh, but we've come into the temple. You remember the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. We're safe. We can make fun of Ellen White because we're in the temple of the Lord. Shame on us. We can read in the history of the Seventh-day Adventists of Christ's day what is to come for Seventh-day Adventism in apostasy in the near future. 
We can read it, folks, right here. Right here, because this is happening right before our eyes. First selected messages, 204 and 205. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. This reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. So let's see, we give up the sanctuary. We say that atonement was done at the cross. We're going to live in sin till Jesus comes. We're going to join up with the other churches in ecumenical unity. The Catholics are okay now because uh, they're Christians just like we are. We don't talk about or use Ellen White anymore because she doesn't know what she's talking about and all our scholars don't believe in her anyway. So there's the doctrines which are the pillars of Adventism. And oh, by the way, it doesn't matter what you do on Sabbath if after the meetings today you know, you want to head over to Wendy's for a quick burger. I mean, that's fine. That's fine. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in His wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. It's first selected messages, page 204 and 205. Folk, I don't know if you've noticed it, but we are in the very throes. We're at the end of the advances of this new movement among God's professed pe people. The principles that make us who we are are being thrown away. And folk, the result would be storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. Just as Solomon's temple disappeared, just as Herod's temple was plowed like a field. We can read in those the results of apostasy among God's professed people today. But you know what? The truth of God, the principles of the three angels' messages, they're going to keep marching right on to glorious victory. And all those that hold on to Christ and those messages will triumph with them. Amen. Let us kneel for prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, thank You for the for the lessons we've learned today from Solomon's temple and Herod's temple. Father, we're, we're just like the ancient Adventists of long ago. We trust lying preachers and prophets and pastors that tell us that somehow we can be saved just by connecting to a church, but just by dropping enough money in the till that somehow that's going to save us in your kingdom. Father, please forgive us for, for our indolence 
for our refusal to study for ourselves, for our refusal to pray in our own private closet to allow you to be the Lord of our lives on a daily basis. Forgive us for trusting that stupidity that will lead us like ancient Adventists of old to ruin. Father, thank you for this little window of opportunity we still have. Help us to make the best and the most out of our time to learn to trust in your power, in your righteousness, to enable us to live out the principles of your law in our lives. And Father, I pray that you would light a torch amongst each of us in our hearts to do all we can to reach as many as possible in this few moments of peace with the three angels' messages. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.